I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this wonderful world of ours. I hope you are safe and sound. Uh, I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of conversations about critical issues to America and to the world. Today, I'm truly pleased to be able to host both Essie Cup and Norman Ornstein to the program. Uh, Essie is a CNN political commentator and practical conservative with a searing honesty who brings her distinct outlook to CNN programming and to special political coverage. She's a graduate of Cornell with a master's degree from NYU. Norm Ornstein is an emer uh, emeritus scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a contributing editor and writer for The Atlantic and has been an election eve analyst for CBS News, BBC. He's also the chairman of the board of the Campaign Legal Center. Welcome to both of you to Carnegie Connects. I truly can think of no two better analysts of American politics to help guide us through the complexity of these midterms. And I have to say, of the 60 plus interviews we've done on this show, beginning in March of 2020, this is the first in which the issues that we're actually discussing are literally playing out as we're analyzing them. It's rather exciting, actually. Um, but it calls for what I would call a cosmic caveat. And needless to say, both the House and the Senate uh, still hang in the balance. And in addition to that uncertainty, I think we have to inject a certain amount of humility when it comes to discussing American politics today because it continues, and I think both of you would agree to surprise. It used to be called Election Day. Now it's probably Election Week or weeks, uh, we may find again in the case of Georgia, a likely runoff in the Senate um, there in at the end of the first week in December. I recall in 2020, it took a couple of weeks to call every state, even though by the early morning of the day after the voting had concluded, we knew the results of 42, at least 42 states in the district. So let, let me start with a big picture question to both of you. Writing in the New York Times, I think yesterday, Nate Cohn offered up four possible scenarios as to how this could end. First was a clear Republican win. Second what is what he described to as a feel like a win for the Democrats. That would be to hold the Senate, a couple of key governorships. Number three was a Republican landslide, the red proverbial red wave as we saw in 94 and 2010. And the fourth was what he termed, I think it was there for the sake of argument only, as a Democratic surprise, which would be the Democrats holding the House and the Senate. So let me ask both of you, I'll start with you, SC. Uh, Wednesday morning, midday, uh, where are we now? We'll get to the why of where we are, but where are we now? And what are the factors do you think that will determine where we're going, and more more important, where we're going to end up. Um, my gut, um, and please disregard all predictions because uh, they're useless. And you know we do our best, but um, I always like to say we won't know until we know, <laughs> and and we certainly won't know why until we get all the exit polling. We certainly at CNN have a lot of exit polling, and we've been analyzing those polls all last night as as they came in and will continue to do so. But my gut is that um, Democrats are going to manage to just barely keep the Senate and Republicans are going to take the House. I think the, the more sort of ecumenical takeaway is going to be that um, Republicans should have done a lot better. Just historically speaking, uh, we know that the party in power is punished in the midterms. Then look at Joe Biden's approval numbers. They're low. Look at the economy, which um, is, you know, needless to say, flagging and a top priority for a lot of voters that definitely helped, um, should have helped Republicans, I think, more. And we can get to this, but I think um, to me, it's pretty clear what hurt Republicans. And that is the, what I'm calling the Trumpster fire. 
Um, I think he's a real drag, a real drag on the party. And I'm wondering if 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 now Republicans will finally start to realize that. But um, it's not it's not a wave and it wasn't a blowout for for either party. Certainly, Um, I think I think it's a split. And it should have been better for Republicans. That's right. Yeah, they underperformed. We'll get to the issue of the Trump factor a yep. little later on. But Norm, over to you. Uh, where are we and where do you think we're going? So we're going to know a little bit more about the Senate, I think, in the next 24 hours uh, because of Nevada. Uh, in Nevada right now, both the governor's race, uh, where the Democratic incumbent, uh, Steve Sisolak, is running behind by about 30 some thousand votes. And in the Senate race, where the same thing is true of uh, Catherine Cortez Masto uh, behind uh, Adam Laxalt. But we also know that there are lots of mail-in ballots, especially in Clark County, which is the overwhelmingly largest county in Nevada and overwhelmingly Democratic, to come. Uh, We don't know how many. I would say if the the numbers get up to 60 to 70,000, Cortez Masto wins. If she wins, and it's, I think, very likely, more than even a little likely, that um, Arizona uh, is uh, going to stay in the hands of Mark Kelly and the Democrats, that would mean Democrats will have 50. And I think that actually makes it easier for them to win a runoff in Georgia because the stakes are not going to be quite as high. So they may even add a seat. Um, but, you know, we don't know for sure. Uh, it's likely that Democrats will lose the majority in the House in the single digits, um, which is much less than uh, a lot of people predicted. Even those who uh, poo poo the idea of a red wave or red tsunami thought that Republicans were still likely to pick up 20 seats or more in the House, and they have not. Um, and I would say, interestingly, there are a couple of reasons. Um, one is Uh, Republicans can thank the Supreme Court, which allowed pretty outrageous racial gerrymandering in a number of states, including Texas and Alabama. Um, And they can thank um, the fact that the Ohio Supreme Court, which tried to keep a completely illegal uh, gerrymander from taking place, which was ignored uh, uh, in the state, uh, and they didn't take any action against it. Without those things, Democrats would still be in the majority. Uh, Now, the other thing that happened is Ron Lauder uh, poured a ton of money into New York to uh, overturn the partisan redistricting that Democrats were trying to do. And Republicans are going to end up picking up maybe four or five seats in New York uh, state. Uh, So all of that means they're going to have a narrow majority. We can talk about what that means, and it doesn't mean good things. Uh, I will say. Um, But the fact is that this was a far better election for Democrats than they anticipated. And the mainstream media joined with the right wing media to pound away at the idea that we were headed for a red wave. And I, I will say here that one of the main reasons and one of the main losers as a consequence is our political journalists who jumped on a bandwagon. And one of the reasons they did so was that in the final month of the campaign, heavily slanted Republican polls, Trafalgar, Rasmussen, Insider Advantage, just flooded the zone with these surveys. They were embraced by 538.com and uh, realclearpolitics.com and their aggregators. They didn't have competition from mainstream surveys that didn't want to spend the money in a lot of these states. And that created a false narrative. Uh, And that, I think, led us to this place. Now, because of that, in part, I think there will be a lot of bloodletting on the Republican side. And it's not just Donald Trump. You're going to see a lot of others. And a house with that narrow a margin is going to be an enormous headache for Kevin McCarthy. But let's face it, it's going to be an equally enormous headache for Joe Biden uh, and for Democrats. Right. I, I do want to get back to the, the, the sort of crisis mentality that pervade, that prevailed. Maybe it was partly the media, maybe it was the fear and concern and anxiety in the wake of January 6th. We're, and we're clearly not beyond that. 
I want to get back to the issue of election integrity and process and move, but I want to, as he referred to the why, uh, rightly pointing out that you're not going to know until you get a, a pretty good breakdown and analysis. But I have to say, you know, if you invited a man or woman from Mars down, looking down on the planet right now, here's what he or she would say. You had record inflation at historic levels. Crime is up. Biden's numbers are down. Huge dissatisfaction in the country. It's all moving in the right, in the wrong direction. People are angry. They're alienated. These midterms should have resulted in a veritable drumming, a, a loss of some 40 to 60 seats. Now Politico is talking about a Republican gain in the single digits. So without the benefit of the exit of scientific and, 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 and doing the analytics, why? I mean, the average loss of an incumbent's party uh, during the first midterm was what, 28, 29 seats? Why, why did the Republicans underperform or arguably okay. overperform, uh, the Democrats overperform? I see. Well, I think the calculus um, that became clear that summer night when Politico leaked what would be a Supreme Court overturning of Roe v. Wade, that changed the political landscape considerably for both parties. Mm -hmm. And then the calculus became crime in the economy over on the right, row and democracy over on the left. And, um, you know, it became a battle between which of those four buckets, right, would drive the most turnout. And I'll say not, not all of us bought into the panic as row kind of dissipated and people thought, oh, you know, Democrats speak too soon. Um, I, you know, I thought it felt clear that, including from polling, that democracy really was on the ballot. And you saw a lot of Democrats work to, um, I thought, very effectively explain why that is. And then in the in the last few weeks, back off of it and say, oh, we shouldn't have done that. And that's too esoteric. And we should have talked more about crime. And they're right about the latter half. They should have talked more about crime. And you can't just say that crime is like a Republican invention. Um, and they should have talked more about the economy in ways that weren't so rosy. You know, Joe Biden going out and saying the economy is great and we're strong as hell isn't how people were feeling. But the democracy message was important. And I got to tell you, as, as much as Trump interfered, tried to inject himself, I think he drummed that message better than anyone else because he kept talking about rigged elections and how we shouldn't trust whatever happens. And then you had his acolytes running for secretaries of state and attorneys general and governors saying that they won't trust the election results. And I think it really did um, add to the fears that are already in the electorate that something's falling apart here. You know, policy disagreements between parties can be solved. A broken democracy can't be neatly put back together again. And so it's not that crime and the economy were less important than we thought. I think they're very important. But I think democracy and, and Roe were just as important. And I think people underestimated how important they ended up being as turnout drivers. Yeah. It's almost as if this wasn't just a referendum on Joe Biden, as most midterms right. are in the incumbent, it was a referendum on other things, maybe even on America itself yeah. in terms of its of where, where we're going as a country. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Norm? So one thing we have to keep in mind, um, you know, Aaron, back when uh, you and I were in graduate school at the University of Michigan, there was a seminal article written by uh, three of my mentors called Surge and Decline, which was about what happens in midterm elections and why they usually go against the president's party. And it is that there's a surge of voting in support of the president's party in a presidential election. And then a lot of those voters don't turn out in midterms and they lose back the seats that they gained in an unusual time. Uh, 
we don't have that much anymore. But keep in mind that there was no surge in 2020. Democrats lost 15 seats in the House. So if there was a, a red mini wave, it actually started in 2020 mm. and then just got added to a little bit in 2022. You can say that the Republicans picked up maybe 20 to 25 seats in those two elections. Well, when you lose a bunch of seats in as they did in 2020, it means that the competitive seats get attenuated some. And that made a difference. Uh, now, you know, Democrats escaped barely in some seats that were pretty strongly Democratic. Um, there are races that could easily have gone the other way. I think another factor is Republican candidates over and over, uh, as the Republican electorate chose them in primaries, were the batshit crazy ones. And some of that was abortion. You know, we had a, a Democrat win uh, and make a takeover of a Republican House seat in North Carolina, new seat, but it would have been Republican seat, because you had a Republican candidate who basically said, well, if there's a 10 year old rape victim who's pregnant, you know, uh, we can make that decision with the local officials sitting in with, uh, you know, the parent, the mother and, uh, and uh, others. And it just was beyond what most, uh, uh, I think, voters thought was appropriate. So Democrats had a strategy, which I do not like, uh, of putting money into trying to uh, influence the Republican electorate. They did this in New Hampshire with Dan Bulldog running against Maggie Hassan. Um, I don't like uh, that cynical approach, but in a couple of cases, it probably worked. Uh, now, you know, with that, uh, I think we saw polls fail us again in terms of scoping out what the important issues were. Uh, I don't frankly think much of the exit polls that we're going to see. It's not just that exit polls themselves are running into problems. Voters coming out of the polling places don't necessarily want to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, of course, we had this surge of early voting. And here we should give some props to Simon Rosenberg, who almost alone out there was saying, look at that early voting. That represents a very different phenomenon while everybody else was jumping on the bandwagon. And, you know, talking about democracy, one of the things that just rankled me was when Biden gave his speech on democracy being on the ballot, um, a bunch of journalists, Shane Goldmacher of the New York Times did a kind of snarky tweet. Why isn't he talking about the things that people care about, inflation and crime? And it's not just that journalists were dismissing the whole idea that our republic is hanging by a thread, which means, as we saw with Donald Trump and um, a, a bunch of others uh, uh, saying, journalists are going to be the first ones we go after if we win. <laughs> uh, but it's also just this sort of dismissive idea that voters don't care about it. Maybe a lot of voters don't, but a whole lot of voters did. And you put together the abortion issue and the way in which it was taken to an extreme. So many instances of rape and incest where the attitude is too bad for them. Or as we've seen in many other cases, an ectopic pregnancy with a non-viable fetus, that non-viable fetus still has rights as well. Even though the mother may die and the fetus is not gonna be uh, able to survive anyhow, put that together with what is a clear and present danger to our democracy. And I think that limited what would have been yeah. the historically typical result. Fascinating. Do either of can you I have just, anything? Um, to... oh, sorry, go I ahead. Can I just Etienne. add, Aaron? Oh, yeah. Yeah, before you go on, because I think you can't overstate um, how radical um, the overturning of Roe and what ensued um, yeah. felt, felt like to a lot of people. Imagine, um, imagine a, a, uh, an electorate that had lived with something for nearly 50 years, considered it a right, and then it's taken away. And a generation after won't have the same rights that their parents or grandparents in many cases had. That is so jarring socially and culturally. And if you look at abortion polling since um, 
its inception, since Gallup started polling abortion <laughs> attitudes in 1976, um, attitudes in this country have remained fixed. There are almost straight lines from 1976 to 2022. And the majority of Americans have always, always um, believed that abortion should be legal with some restrictions. Under that, a minority of Americans believe that abortion should be legal with no restrictions. And way under that, you have a very small minority of Americans who have believed that abortion should be illegal in all cases, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of Republicans were talking about doing and in some cases did. And so this, I mean, cataclysmic real, you know, really shift in the American political, cultural, social, generational landscape, I think rattled people in a very real way. Even some conservatives I knew that had talked about, you know, very theoretically overturning Roe and truly never believed it would happen. Once it started to happen and you heard people talking about the real consequences, um, it became real. And what I've been saying is Republicans, I think it seemed to a lot of people, wanted to, to take the country into this like DeLorean, this dystopian DeLorean back in time with all this regressive stuff, not just abortion bans, but book bans and turning teachers in and this stuff that, you know, I don't think a lot of people, even a lot of folks in the center and center right wanted. That really, I think, woke people up. And yes, economy and crime are still important, but it's not just esoteric democracy. It was that kind of real stuff that Republicans kept talking about actually wanting to do, and in some cases did, that I think woke up a lot of voters who you know might have otherwise stayed home. Some of the exit polling I, I, I saw seemed to suggest three out of 10 voters, I think, um, thought abortion was the most important issue, but six out of 10 was against the Supreme Court decision on Roe. Is it too much of a stretch to argue that, that forget the headlines here, but the trend lines might suggest that there is, there really is a sort of hard ceiling on what I would call the radical crazy factor. I remember a Republican uh, woman, they asked, why did you vote for Joe Biden? And her response was, not because I'm a Democrat, because I wanted to use her words, New York Times reported, to get rid of that crazy, quote, this is 2020, that quote, quote, crazy, unquote, in the White House. I mean, is it too much of a stretch to believe that what both of you are saying could actually represent some sort of trend looking toward the general? Boy, I wish I could say that, but I can't. Um, first of all, Let's say that Donald Trump just fades away um, or uh, reemerges in an orange jumpsuit. Um, uh, what are we left with? Um, maybe it's Ron DeSantis, although I tell you, I'm not entirely sure that he's ready for national prime time. I watched the debate with Charlie Crist where he was just awful. But Ron DeSantis is smarter and tougher than uh, is Donald Trump. And DeSantis's model is Viktor Orban. And I still fear that we could slide into yeah. um, a, a, a Hungary type uh, dynamic. I uh, am not a, a fan of Glenn Youngkin, who I think is a smoother version of Ron DeSantis, who dresses a little bit better. <laughs> um, we're not heading in a better direction there. And in terms of the curbs on the crazies, even though I completely agree with Essie about uh, the impact of the abortion issue. We're going to have a bunch of states who are still moving forward with utterly destructive policies. And it's not even about abortion. It is about denying pregnant women who have cancer the drugs they need to control their cancer because it might have an impact on a fetus. It's about states that are denying birth control and candidates and many of these states may move in the direction of banning contraception. It's about women facing a miscarriage that they don't want, who are being told they're gonna to have to carry fetuses that are not gonna to survive to term, threatening their own lives. So all of this will continue. 
if they didn't do as well as they hoped to do in the election, if they didn't sweep into power everywhere, they're in power in a lot of places. And what we have is a party that I believe has become a cult. And in a cult, you know, I'm looking at the Republicans who are coming into the House and the new ones coming into the Senate as well. Some of them are radicals and believe all of this stuff deeply. A lot of others are simply cowards who fear being excommunicated or shunned or threatened. And smaller numbers doesn't mean that they're going to say, oh, my God, the electorate has taught us a lesson. We have mm -hmm. to become more moderate. We're not yeah. there yet. And I, and I will say uh, on this front firmly and finally, we need a viable Republican Party. It is going to be a very conservative party, and that's just fine. Uh, excuse me for a second. This is not supposed to happen. We need a viable conservative party that is a problem-solving party. And we're still a long ways away from having an Essie Cup party <laughs> instead of a Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor Greene party. Let me ask both of you about um, the process, election integrity. Um, this is the first election after January 6th. There were all sorts of reports of uh, possible voter fraud, delays in counting, voter intimidation. Um, the election is going to lead to lawsuits for sure. But it, it seems that as a stress test, and I understand only 40, average of 40% 40 of the Americans turn out for midterms, but as a stress test, did we pass? Yes. We did, and I think we uh, we dodged another bullet there as well. You're right. Um, if Arizona turns out the way we expect it will, I will bet that Kerry Lake will deny uh, the election results and will try and uh, litigate it. And we're going to have problems in a number of places. But I have to say that for the most part, we're not seeing, even those who said they wouldn't uh, accept election results if they lost, we're not seeing many instances of people going completely to the mat there. And the defeats in most cases are big enough. Uh, and the election officials had enough integrity in most places that we didn't have the catastrophe that we could have had. And the fact that Democrats, I think, are going to be able to prevail in many of these races for secretary of state, the election officials in states against election deniers makes it at least feasible that we could head into 2024 without uh, the real catastrophe that we faced before. But we still need Congress to act on things like the Electoral Count Act to protect us even further from chicanery uh, the next time around. Right. Essie, any, any thought on the stress test, the health of our democratic process this time around? Well, I'm still waiting to see what happens um, with the Secretary of State race in Arizona, Mark Fincham, mm -hmm. one of the most, I think, deleterious, dangerous forces. Um, and there were, you know, a lot of those. Um, Christina Caramo in Michigan, she lost, thankfully, um, running for Secretary of State there. And then you've got Jim Marchant in Nevada um, running for Secretary of State. There are others who have openly said they might not, you know, validate um elections that they disagreed with that they didn't like and that is awful and shouldn't be rewarded and i worry that some of those folks will be rewarded and then it's not just what they actually do um to decertify or certify elections and effectively break the system but what that encourages other people to do we're not going to rid the party of Trumpism, which which I agree is a cult. It doesn't behave like a political party anymore um, about, you know, ideas and principles and policies. It's it's cultism and kind of whatever, you know, Trump's last impulses were or the culture wars or owning the libs. That's what's motivating it. Um, and in a, a lot of cases, the cruelty is the point. Yeah. Um, if that is reaffirmed, um, it's going to be all the that much harder to rid the Republican Party of Trumpism, because even if it consolidates and shrinks, it will still condense. And that con the condensing of the Republican Party. So it's almost 100 percent 
pure, 100% concentrate, right? With no apostates, no more Kinzingers, no more Cheneys. In a couple of years, maybe no more Romneys. Um, certainly no more SE Cups, right? No, no more, you know, all the never Trumpers have, have gone. As it condenses and becomes completely pure, it might be real small, but it's real hard to penetrate that. And so to Norm's point, will they learn the lessons of the Doug Mastrianos and, you know, the, the Baldocks and the, you know, maybe the Herschel Walkers? I don't know. I mean, I, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene's going to march back into Congress with, you know, feeling pretty cocky and pretty good about what she's been spewing, the, the, the garbage and the conspiracy theories and the anti-Semitism. She's going to feel pretty good about it and maybe even double and triple down on it. Yeah. I was going to ask each of you to comment um, as Republicans and Democrats on the future of the party. And, and SC, you, you, you've already done that. I, in a binary political system, when you only have two parties, in order for you have self-governance that's effective, both parties have to color within certain norms, institutions, yeah. and parameters. And clearly, we don't have that. But thanks, Essie, for your views on the Republican Party. Now, Norm, I want to ask you about the Democrats, because I do want to get to the future of Congress, the 118th Congress and what we can expect, assuming the Republicans do take the House and the Democrats maintain a, well, it's 50-50 perhaps with a, the vice president breaking a tie. On the future of the, of the Democratic Party, Norm, I want to ask you a specific question about the past the last couple of years. You know, there was all this talk about how the Democrats just don't understand the message. The messaging is terrible. And I recall the word, I recall Paul Begala saying that um, the Titanic had an iceberg problem, not a communications problem. And it's really hard to message your way out of reality. So what is it that Democrats have to do to once again expand their base uh, and to attract uh, those independents or even moderate Republicans who are uh, concerned about the future of their own party. So, I, I, you're first of all, you're exactly right. Um, uh, you know, the Democrats uh, have message issues. That's not their biggest uh, problem, but it's a problem. And I do think that, you know, one of the reasons that Ron DeSantis has done so well, even while making some horrific decisions, is that Floridians see him as a strong guy, a tough guy. He just goes ahead and does it. And that's been a problem for Biden. One of the things that I really hoped that Biden would do when inflation really started to flare and gas prices went shooting up, if he had called in the uh, seven CEOs of the biggest oil companies and excoriated them publicly for their excess profits and profiteering off the American people, it would have looked as if he were fighting on the side of the American people uh, instead of continuing to talk, as, as he said, about how great things were. You need to feel pain, but you also need to show that you're fighting. And Democrats have, I think, an inherent difficulty. They believe that actions speak for themselves. And they don't. You need to frame things. And the president has the bully pulpit. And he did do some of that towards the end of the campaign and got, you know, as with the democracy issue, got criticized for it. He did take on the oil companies. But long after it had already settled in that Democrats were presiding over this terrible inflation. And Democrats need to do a better job. On the crime issue, I watched the debate with Val Demings and little Marco Rubio. And she, I, I'm sorry, but I can't call him Marco. It's always little Marco. Uh, no. the one legacy of Trump that I uh, grasped onto. But Val Demings took on that crime issue by turning it into a gun issue. And Democrats are on solid ground when it comes to the gun issue. Uh, and they haven't used it. And they basically danced away from the crime issue. Now, it's true that if you look objectively at murder rates, in most places, they're not shooting up compared to where they were in the past. The murder rates are much greater in states like Oklahoma and Alabama than they are in New York. Doesn't matter if people feel that they can't walk out onto the streets without facing the possibility of a crime. 
if every day, you know, I get the emails from the New York Daily News, five every day are about somebody who's been shot or been beaten to death or yeah. been pushed onto the subway tracks. That's the story that dominates. You have to try to change that narrative and make the other side explain why they're for letting everybody have an assault weapon, uh, why it's not a problem if a 15-year-old gets uh, one, all of those things. So you can do better with messaging, and they have not done as well with messaging. But what's also clear is that you have to do more in terms of the policies and the way you frame your own policies if you're going to reach out to that broader group of voters. And you have to be cognizant. You know, as it turns out, I think nationally, Democrats have done about as well with Hispanic voters as they did in 2020, as they did in, uh, in 2018. It's probably going to break down around 65, 35 or thereabouts. But if you're looking towards the future and you look at the drubbing you took among Hispanics in Florida and Miami-Dade County, you look at the fact that in Texas, you're not doing better even as you have a larger share, even of Mexican Americans. You got to figure out how you can apply your policies to appeal to the growing groups of voters while keeping your own base. And if you want to get to Joe Biden, as we were talking about, Democrats are going to have a problem in 2024. Do you nominate an incumbent president who would be 86 years old when he finished his second term? And it might still work out that way. He might end up having a pretty good year and be in very strong health. But if not, you're going to have a wide open field. In the aftermath of Dobbs, can you afford to bypass a woman and pick a man again and have a significant portion of your base be disappointed yet again? Can you ignore the heir apparent who is a woman and a person of color and hold on to your own base? We'll be 15 candidates out there, including some very impressive ones, but it's tough to be able to prevail under those circumstances. Yeah. And you don't want to just hope that the Republicans have their own cage matches with Trumpists against uh, anti-Trumpists, uh, with DeSantis uh, being threatened by Trump, uh, with people uh, tearing themselves apart if you can't keep your own base together. So they've got a problem, and it's, of course, the ages old problem as well of mollifying your uh, moderates and your uh, progressives. They have a much smaller problem on that front than Republicans do, but it's a problem nevertheless. And what happens with Nancy Pelosi now? And what kind of a, a leader will we have for Democrats if Pelosi decides to leave? Can Schumer keep his 50 or 51 in line? And let me just say, finally, I know I've gone on a little bit too long. It's not just about the 118th Congress, Aaron. It's about the remainder of the 117th. You're losing the House. You've got to solve the debt ceiling problem before the crazies in the House try and uh, push us to default. You've got to make sure you've got funding for Ukraine in place if they try and hold it hostage or, as Marjorie Taylor Greene said, not one more dime for Ukraine. Right. You've got to try and make sure the Justice Department has enough money to carry out its own responsibilities, including furthering the investigations of January 6th. January 6th committee has to wrap it all up and put it together in a nice bow. If they lose the Senate, they're going to have to confirm as many judges and executive appointees as they can in a very short period of time when people don't want to be there. So yeah. there are big challenges that Democrats have in their continuing majority before they lose the House. Right. I don't want to prejudge your answers on this, but are, are we looking at a, a Congress over the next two years that's going to be wall to wall investigations, unilateral constraints against uh, just say no to the Democrats. Is that what we're is that what we're looking at, or is there any any possibility that divided government, that's the way it turns out, is capable of doing anything that's positive? Essie, um, I don't have a ton of optimism. Uh, you know, I think the Jim Jordans and the Marjorie Taylor Greens, uh, and more importantly, their voters want the politics of revenge. They want to punish Democrats. 
um, and even, you know, Republicans that don't stay in line with with where they want to go. And they'll do that. And I think Kevin McCarthy um, will think he has to do that to, you know, suck up to that wing of the party and maybe keep Trump in his, you know, good graces. And, you know, uh, so I think you're going to get a lot of that. And, you know, there has not been a lot of political profitability in solving problems and, you know, coming together. And I, I was very surprised um, this past year that we got the the movement on guns that we did, because in the past, one or both sides would ask for something small and then gum it up with something large and, and nothing would happen. And I was pretty impressed with Chris Murphy's discipline, uh, frankly, this time around, because I know that's a, an important issue to him. He's, he's my senator. I haven't always been on the same side of that issue <clears throat> as he is. But being willing to take the small things, the incrementalism, it's not a strength of Democrats. And he did it. And we got more than we've seen um, in a long time on guns. Not, not as much as I know a lot of people want. But, you know, something is something. When it comes to the big challenges we have to face, you know, many of which Norm laid out, but also immigration and, um, you know, lot, lots of challenges, there's, there's not a lot of reward for incrementalism and coming to some kind of um, middle, middle point. Uh, so both sides have to want to do that. And to do that, both sides have to be willing to give up some stuff. And sometimes when you solve things, you can't run on them. You can't fundraise off of them. You can't create the kind of fear that is very motivating yeah. for a lot of voters. And that's gross and lamentable, and I wish that weren't the case. But that's been the reality for a long time, and it seems to be only getting worse because you don't have a strong Republican Party. You have, um, you know, you have a very, I think, very weak Republican Party. Uh, that is, like I said, not a party of ideas. They're not competing over ideas and policies and, and principles. Um, they're competing, competing over fame and celebrity and power and, um, you know, access to Trump. And, and that's not healthy and that's not going to lead them in the right place. It's certainly not going to help them govern, right, and do the things that they're elected to do. Yeah. One final question before we before we close. Um, is there any relationship at all between what we witnessed yesterday and, and what we will witness in the weeks to come and the presidential contest in 2024? One's about the present, the midterms, the other about the future. I've been warned not to draw any conclusions at all from what we've seen, but I can't help think that the headlines today may end up creating certain trend lines in the next two years that will impact on the general. But I just wonder, you you guys do this for a living. Um, Norm? So before I answer that, Aaron, let me follow on what, uh, with your last question, what Essie said, and get at least a little bit to uh, foreign policy. <laughs> As, oh no! Uh, oh no! You know, George Will said that Norm George Will said that when it comes to foreign policy, Americans want as little, as little of it as possible. <laughs> I, I understand that. Career. It's just um, is it is it important, Norm? Well, what I what I think is going to happen here is the investigations are not just going to be about Hunter Biden and his laptop. They're going to be about Afghanistan, and they're going to tie up Tony Blinken and as many State Department people as they can. And some of these radicals are going to go overseas and try to undermine our alliances and uh, build their stronger relationships with Putin, with um, MBS, um, with dictators uh, like Orban, who, remember, was showcased at uh, CPAC both in Hungary and in Texas. So yeah. it's going to create headaches for Biden in terms of foreign policy. I fear an intelligence committee that is going to leak stuff that will undermine the administration as well. So we got, you know, a lot of issues there in terms of now, maybe that'll make a difference for 2024. Maybe there'll be such a shit show that Democrats can run by saying, do you really want more of this? Do you really want 
a, a party that has no interest in policy. You look at what Kevin McCarthy has said. All right, what would you do as speaker? And it's all investigations and impeachments. And also the policy, trying to make sure that Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid uh, don't stay as they are. Uh, nothing on health policy beyond that. Nothing on climate change. Nothing on pandemics. I mean, so maybe that'll make a difference for 2024. But we are so far from understanding what the shape of the electorate will be in 2024, what the major issues will be when we head towards that point, how the parties are going to shake out their nominating processes. So uh, what will happen if and when, and I think it's when, Trump gets indicted and probably indicted multiple times, will that change the attitude of elected Republicans towards him? Will all those voters who are still largely with Trump, despite his embarrassments from yesterday, um, you know, rise up in anger? Are we going to have a lot of violence? You know, the attack on Paul Pelosi may be a harbinger of things to come. What will all that do? I can't make any predictions from what happened yesterday or what will happen in the next month in terms of extrapolating to 2024. Yeah, not that I'm drawing parallels, but indicting sitting leaders uh, is not necessarily a constraint against their popularity. Uh, you just witnessed an extraordinary yes. election in Israel in which 71% of the electoral voted. There was no storming of the Knesset. There was no election denial. There was a dignified concession speech, no violence, a peaceful transition of power. And yet the government is going to uh, to be led almost certainly by the most right wing coalition in Israel's history and by a guy who's under indictment for fraud, bribery and breach of trust. So I don't know how it's going to play out here, but but I, your 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 comment, Norm, I think should inject a, a good deal of humility into trying to project what um, we can't see around corners. Yeah. I see. I'll give you the last word if you want it. Otherwise, I'll. Yeah, I mean, I'll, everything that Norm just said is right. And, and he's identified all the looming question marks. I would just add. Um, I've been saying for a, a while now that Joe Biden needs to let his party know what he is going to do in 2024. And that's because um, the more this remains a question mark. Mm -hmm. Um, the more he is undermined because every, you know, yeah. it's every opportunity that a reporter has to stop a Democrat in the halls of Congress and say, would you vote for, you know, Joe Biden? Do you want him to run? Well, enough of them have said no. And enough of them have said, you know, or, or sort of danced around it. That's a bad look for someone who might run. Um, and if he doesn't want to run, then he needs to give his party an opportunity to figure out who they're going to put up and 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 put their best foot forward and give voters an opportunity to see these people, not at the last minute or the 11th hour, but over the next two years, make their case, make their case to the American people why, why they should take the mantle. And Democrats don't need to be embarrassed by Joe Biden maybe not running in 2024. He was always meant to be a transitional president, not a transformational one. Democrats can own that and say, absolutely, he did the job. He got he got it done. And now we need to move on. But the longer this takes, this question mark of, of will he or won't he, I think it's it hurts Democrats and it hurts Joe Biden and it helps Republicans. Yeah. Let me thank both of you for your time, your authority, your expertise, and, and the way you make very complicated issues extraordinarily accessible and understandable to normal humans. I, I really appreciate that. So uh, thank you so much. Um, Thanks, Aaron. For all you Carnegie Connects viewers and listeners, next week um, we'll be talking to um, Tom Friedman about America, uh, the state and fate of America and, and in the world. So tune in. Take care. And until next time, think positive, but definitely test negative. Bye-bye. <laughs>